Edward Kennedy Ellington said, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. What good is melody? What good is music if it ain't possessing something sweet? It ain't the melody. It ain't the music. There's something else that makes the tune complete. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. It don't mean a thing. All you got to do is sing. It makes no difference if it's sweet or hot. Just give that rhythm everything you got. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. This song is a jazz classic. And not only musicologists, but philosophers have written papers about it. One philosopher writes, there is a deep Socratic wisdom here. A life without swing is not worth living. Other philosophers come to mind. Rene Descartes might have very well said, I swing, therefore I am. <laughs> so what is it that without it, life doesn't mean a thing? Duke Ellington's life and his music hold out a powerful answer to this question. Born in Washington, D.C. in 1899, the grandson of a freed slave, Edward Kennedy Ellington's father worked as a butler for a prominent white doctor and took occasional work catering at the White House. His mother, Daisy, played him hymns on their upright piano at home, and on Sundays took him to the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She taught him that all people have worth because God made them. And she continually told him that he was blessed. Of course, being born black in the United States in 1899 meant that a person was denied many of the benefits of democracy and justice. Racial prejudice, lack of resources, lynching, and a general derogatory culture toward people of color was widespread. These are not usually thought of as the prescription for a life of being blessed. But as Jonna Tull Steed explains in her spiritual biography of Ellington, black Protestants had their own perspective on the stories found in the Christian tradition. These stories were part of the air that young Edward breathed. To be blessed was to be a player in a long story of many chapters, begun with the creation of the world and concluded with the perpetual bliss at the end of time. The story suggested what great reversals might occur in the cosmic drama. Kings became slaves and servants became sages. Barren, barrenness, barrenness was changed to fertility. Lions were made tame. Fire did not destroy. Small forces conquered great armies. Impassable rivers were crossed, and storms did not overwhelm. Rulers were deposed, and the humble elevated. Anything could happen. So Edward grew up with a feeling of being providentially guided. He had a sense that he had a vocation and a purpose, and that he and everyone else on some level are a reflection of God. Because of this, he found beauty and possibility and grace in unlikely people and places. He would never finish high school. He often played hooky, and he spent time listening to piano players in local pool halls. At first, he was drawn to the visual arts, but eventually he learned that playing piano made him a hit at parties, and especially to attractive girls. He married Edna Thompson when he was 19. They had a son, Mercer, the next year. Their second child died in infancy. He was said to be an enterprising adolescent who at times sold hot dogs at baseball games of the Washington Senators and was a soda jerk at the Poodle Dog Cafe. But music, music held out some unique opportunities for black musicians in that time. And he began filling in for other musicians and eventually created his own band. In time, he moved to New York and became a part of the Harlem Renaissance. It was an exciting 
and very creative time in Harlem. In 1927, he got a gig as a band leader at the Cotton Club. The club capitalized on the popular fascination around the country with all things African. And they required Ellington to play and compose what they called jungle music. It was a constraining musical form for Ellington, but the job also required that he create music to accompany a variety of dance and dramatic performances each night, which called on him to be innovative. The shows were broadcast live on national radio, and Ellington and his band soon became renowned across the country. Ellington became a significant part of the development of jazz music. In order to create new sounds, Ellington encouraged his band members to use their own unique styles and strengths, telling them, no one else can do it like you can. He was said to bring out capacities in the musicians he worked with that surpassed everyone, including their own expectations. He had a way of making musicians feel comfortable with their own talent so that they would begin to express themselves freely rather than trying to imitate someone else's sound. The upside of this was incredible innovation and improvisation. The downside was that whenever his band lost a member, they would have to replace some of the major songs in their repertoire because of the loss of a particular sound. It didn't matter if he found another excellent musician who played the same instrument. Ellington had to create new music that capitalized on the unique gifts of the new player. In fact, that is a big part of what it means to have swing. It's about believing that each person is one of a kind and that what's unique in each person is a gift from God. It's one thing to play the notes of a score, and it's a completely other thing to add some swing and personality. Rick, can you, can you just play some notes of a song without swing? All right, now add a little bit of swing to that. Right. So you hear the difference. And it's the same with your life. Anyone can go through the motions. Anyone can follow a routine and do what they're supposed to do, day in and day out. But it's a whole other thing to live with that swing. Philosopher, philosophy professor Donald Kiefer suggests that we are wary of people who just go through the motions. He says, deep practical analogies can be found in the kitchen and in the bedroom, two of our most private, personal worlds. In the kitchen, we say that the cook who tastes and improvises all along the way in the execution of a recipe is the gifted cook rather than the one tied to the recipe. In the bedroom, what could, what could be closer than the analogy of making love with that of making music, as opposed to just having sex with that of just playing the notes? The two analogies capture two different, highly valued potentials in the human spirit. First, we admire individual inventiveness and initiative. Second, we praise and yearn for the capacity to reciprocally provide and receive love, pleasure, and excitement from another human being. There seems to be some very practical analogies between these two realms of activity. So where does that vitality, that individual inventiveness and initiative come from? Duke Ellington and his music offer us some powerful clues. 